Haiti is a collapsing state. We are talking about the poorest nation in the so-called West, whose inhabitants are in one of the most bleak and depressing situations of misery in the world. Haiti is the scene of a tragedy that has been going on for centuries, which the international community doesn't seem willing nor able to remedy. The blame for such a disaster lies not only with the uncontrollable forces of nature, but also with the great powers. France and the United States above all, as well as the rulers of Haiti themselves, corrupt to the core. We are talking about a state where it's common to eat mud cakes, real mud cakes mixed with powder and food grease, a popular option in Cité Soleil, which is one of the poorest slums in Port-au-Prince, the capital, where hunger is a daily problem. Port-au-Prince has now fallen into the hands of gangs and has turned into a kind of no man's land. But what are the origins of such chaos? It is possible to trace them. It was just a year ago this week that Francois Duvalier, president for life of the Caribbean Republic of Haiti, died. President Jovenel Moise was assassinated early this morning. The story of Haiti is perhaps one of the most distressing and difficult to tell. Once called the Jewel of the Antilles, the island of Hispaniola, now divided between Haiti to the west and the Dominican Republic to the east, was the richest colony in the entire world. The ancient Taino people, composed of amiable, tractable, peaceful Indians, as Christopher Columbus has described them in his letters, were quickly decimated by conquistadores by sword and disease. The sudden disappearance of the locals, however, prompted the European settlers to quickly look for another source of labor to exploit in the cultivation of Hispaniola's main resource, sugar. The colonists opted to recruit as many slaves as possible, turning their sights naturally to West Africa and finding a solution in the infamous Atlantic route. In the span of 30 years, from 1517 to 1540, more than 30,000 Africans were, pardon the term, imported to Hispaniola, and shortly thereafter the western part of the island, still sparsely frequented by Spanish, gradually became a haunt for buccaneers committing raids in the Caribbean Sea, many of them French. Frenchmen who, in the mid-17th century, finally succeeded in establishing themselves in the western quadrants of the island, obviously in an entirely illegitimate form, naming it Saint-Domingue. Haiti alone came to account for as much as 50% of the entire French gross national product, exporting to the old continent not only sugar, but also coffee, cocoa, tobacco, cotton, indigo, and several other products considered exotic. It is by no means a coincidence that Saint-Domingue was, at that time, the richest colony on the globe and the most active mercantile center in the New World. The entire Haitian society was compressed by rigid social castes in the 18th century. At the top were the Great Whites, the landowners, the colonial elite patched up with metropolitan French, which amounted to 40,000 individuals. The second social class was the Mulattoes, born of unions, in most cases violent, between whites and slaves, and consisted of just 28,000 people. Finally, there were the 450,000 slaves who led a life of deprivation, hunger and pain. This slave colony, observed the Marquis de Rouvray in the late 18th century, is like a city ready to be attacked. We are walking on barrels loaded with gunpowder. Well, Blowing up those barrels in 1789 came the French Revolution. Inspired by the ideals that had shocked Paris and tired of the summary massacres carried out by whites, mestizos and the free slaves under the leadership of the now free man Toussaint Louverture and the fugitive Jean-Jacques Desalines responded to violence with violence. I have given the French cannibals blood for blood, proclaimed Desalines, considered the father of the Haitian nation, and nicknamed the Black Napoleon. I have avenged America, he said. The new republic thus became the first independent nation of all Latin America, the second on the entire continent, anticipated only by the United States. In no other case throughout history has an enslaved people been able to break the chains of servitude and defeat. With a military response. Finally, the name Saint-Domingue was changed to Haiti. Emerging out of the chaos, however, was once again the ruling power elite, the 3% of the population that had enjoyed greater benefits and freedoms under the former colonizers, and which reintroduced the typical slave system. In other words, the French colonial legacy was perpetuated by a simple handover. What's more, Haitians, although free, found themselves living in a world completely hostile to the idea of a territory self-governed by blacks. An independent Haiti was 
in fact a nightmare for all those powers for whom slavery was kinda normal, starting with the United States. The so-called international community, or rather at that time Europe, condemned the Haitian model, which is that of a nation of freed slaves. It was for this reason that in the years following the independence, Europeans in the United States coordinated to prepare a full-fledged diplomatic embargo on the island. France refused to recognize Haiti's existence as a state, and intimated that it was necessary to pay compensation due to land confiscation after after the revolution. It's an absurdity since it's usually the losers who have to pay compensation if you think about it. The request was however formalized, so to speak, in 1825 when a French ship loaded with canals entered Port-au-Prince and an emissary of King Charles X intimated to the Haitians that they must pay a debt of 150 million francs to be paid in five annual installments. To repay the debt, Haiti sought a loan from a group of French banks. That's it. In this way, the island's economy sank and the state coffers were depleted for generations to come. The impossibility of having an economically sound nation was fertile ground for coups and government assassinations. Indeed, since 1855, the average office of Haitian presidents has amounted to just one year. There's no question that being president of Haiti shouldn't be a pleasant job. We can be reminded of this by the last head of state in chronological order, Jovenel Moïse, who was killed in 2021 in his presidential residence by an unidentified gang group. As if that weren't enough, the US also got in the way. As early as the beginning of the 20th century, the US had practically taking possession of the Dominican Republic, the eastern half of Hispaniola, which in the previous course had repeatedly gained independence from Spain. Then, in 1915, Woodrow Wilson gave orders to initiate the invasion of Haiti as well, in order to help the people. The interrupted French imperialism then changed only in the origin of the master. Haiti was seen as an insult to imperialism and the United States, which feared uh, the German investments began in the late 19th century in the island, applied the so-called Monroe Doctrine, idealistically summarized as America to Americans. More pragmatically, Wilson sought a military base in the Caribbean Sea. The Marines took control of Haiti's tax revenues and the National Bank, forcing the past passage of a new constitution that, in essence, nullified the ban which was established in 1804, that prevented any foreigner from owning land in the country. Without a blow, in short, Washington had created a new vassal state that would remain loyal even after the occupation ended in 1934. However, the occupation of the Dominican Republic had already ended in 1924, but after six years of peace, the United States unleashed the coup that brought Rafael Leonidas Trujillo to power. Assassin's bullet put a bloody end to the 31-year dictatorship of Dominican strongman Rafael Trujillo, here with his brother Hector. Under Trujillo, a nationalist thinking was institutionalized, and this traced the origins of the Dominican people back to the conquistadores. They mixed it with an anti Haitian sentiment when, in 1937, Trujillo had tens of thousands of Haitians residing in the territory of the Dominican Republic killed with a method that was peculiar and simple and cruel. In fact, we refer to this entire operation as the Parsley Massacre. Upon meeting the people, the military would ask them what it was all about. Anyone who failed to correctly pronounce the word perejil, meaning parsley in Spanish, and telling the world with a mousy R. Actually, in English, I just found out that the typical R French people say when speaking is actually called French R. Not a, what did I say? A, a mousy R. Would automatically be considered a francophone, hence Haitian, and thus subject to physical elimination. You should know that since 1950, but especially from 1946 onwards, the United States, through various economic and humanitarian aid packages, has wisely played a key role in Haitian politics. Great, the population is safe. Yes, in an earthly reality like ours, these subsidies simply went into the wrong pockets, those of the Haitian rulers. The most rapacious to take advantage of the so-called Western benevolence was an intellectual at first very well liked by many. Physician François Duvalier, 
nicknamed Papa Doc. Duvalier was elected president in 1957. However, it took little time to turn him into a dictator. First, Papa Doc organized a personal vigilante force. These death squads came to be nicknamed Tonton Makuts, an appellation that, according to Haitian folklore, was attributed to the boogeyman who at night would kidnap children by hiding them in a sack. It's difficult to say how many people disappeared at the hands of Duvalier's teams, but the estimates are not the most comforting. There's talk of tens of thousands of desaparecidos. Basically, if you had any doubt about Duvalier, this could lead you to a mass grave, along with your entire family. Nevertheless, the international community didn't pay much attention to Papa Doc's schizophrenic behavior. Indeed, during his first four and bloodiest years in power, Duvalier received from Washington the beauty of more than 40 million dollars, most of it in the form of outright gifts. The White House, as reported in Paul Farmer's essay, the uses of 80 had only one purpose, to keep Duvalier in power. It was necessary to prevent Haiti from going the way of socialist Cuba and continuing to serve the interest of the US government, despite the fact that beginning in the 1960s, thousands of Haitians preferred to flee on makeshift boats to the coast of Florida in search of political asylum rather than remaining on the island. Corruption, after all, was so entrenched as to be an accepted practice throughout Haiti. Even today, senior government officials exploit their position to amass power and wealth at the expense of ordinary citizens. And police smuggle fuel, which there is, of course, shortage, and then they sell it on the black market. On closer inspection, even the imposition of the official language, French, testifies to the imbalances that snake through a nation incapable of coming to terms with the past. In fact, all state business is conducted in French. However, only 10% of the inhabitants are able to express themselves in this language, and less than 5% speak it fluently. Indeed, the language of the masses is the Haitian Creole. The problem is that to be successful in you necessarily have to speak French. One result of this language oppression is the abominable national illiteracy rate, which approaches 90% in the cities, and it's even higher in rural areas. The reason is that people are needed, manpower in the fields is needed for all those families who cannot get by, partly because the search for work has driven almost all Haitians to the capital. The demographic imbalance whereby the inhabitants of the entire country total 11 million people in a territory that is as vast as Tuscany, for example in Italy, is a burden to another long-standing problem on the island, the continuing destruction of the ecosystem and the soil erosion. Try taking a look at the satellite images nearby Haiti's border with the Dominican Republic. You will notice how, on the left, the vegetation appears to be much less prominent. What does this mean? It means that Haiti is a predominantly mountainous country, and over the past 200 years, the people there have been indiscriminately cutting down trees without replanting them. The spectacle that unfolds every single year during the five months of rainfalls, when rivers of mud slide down the mountain slopes, is just one of the visible effects of the savage deforestation. The main reason for Haitians to destroy their land is the scarcity of fuel, with wood having been the only material for lighting a fire for centuries. People can afford to cook exclusively with charcoal, which requires large quantity of wood. And here we are to another hoax for the Haitian people. Most of its best land domestically produces crops for export, not for the domestic market. Haiti, which would be an agricultural country, is nothing more than a net importer of food. If you are wondering why, Suffice is it to say that almost all of the land is controlled by the 3% that represents the Haitian elite. Of course, the money that flows into the pockets of the local oligarchy through export is not redistributed into the national economy to build, I don't know, roads or hospitals, but it's spent in foreign markets, the United States, Europe and the Gulf countries. And so, while a sugarcane cutter can call himself lucky if he earns $1 a day, the domestic and foreign companies, let's be explicit for the sake of fairness, US companies that manage the land make stellar profits. Faced with a condition of permanent exploitation, one should therefore not be surprised that so many Haitians have joined organized crime and gangs, which are by the way the same of Papa Doc's uh, Tonton Makut. Continuing to surf the waves of Haitian history, we come to 1990, the year when pro-democracy Presbyterian Jean-Bertrand Aristide incredibly won the presidential election with 67% of the votes. This was an incredible result. 
considering the whole history of Haiti. But what happened? Well, the Americans came again, forced Aristide into exile, imposed a dictator, the UN declared an embargo on Haiti, and after four years, Bill Clinton came back to fix the disaster that the United States themselves had committed. Aristide came back, was deposed, came back again, was accused of corruption, and in 2004, a good civil war broke out. Or at least, that was how the UN justified the deployment of MINUSTA forces, that is, the United Nations Stabilization Mission in Haiti, which was supposed to lead the country through a democratic transition. And if you think you have already seen hell, note that until now we have solely visited purgatory. Haiti has been the scene of natural disasters that destroyed not only its society, but also any tiny chance of getting back on its feet. As previously mentioned, gangs in Haiti have very clear intentions to take control of the black market and manage the drug trade but without assuming power. Even should one gang be able to undermine the others, attempting a coup would be very counterproductive. Haiti is already in the hands of criminal gangs, and establishing a real government would only mean losing the trust of those who support them and see them as the only solution to the current political disaster. This is well known by one of Port-au-Prince's most powerful leaders, Jimmy Cherizier, and whose nickname, by the way, is Barbecue. I'll let you imagine why. In short, here we are, peering through the gates of hell. I confess to you that, in the face of so much anguish, I have no solution, no moral to say at the end of this video. And yet I feel so much frustrated with an international community that, in concrete terms, does nothing at all except to make promises and promises. In October 2022, for example, Henri requested the deployment of foreign military forces in Port-au-Prince with the aim of quelling the violent gang clash that had broken out the previous July in Cité Soleil. Do you know who answered the call? Yep, the US. A tragic comic outcome for the situation of a nation, Haiti, that can neither rid itself of its past nor free itself from the evils that perennially afflict it and that unfortunately fall on the 11 and a half million inhabitants who every single day see their hopes fade more and more. In Haiti, the stars do not shine.